Joining us online is Bjorn Lomberg. He is president of the Copenhagen Consensus, visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and visiting professor at Copenhagen Business School. His upcoming book is False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the, Pianic, uh, the, the Planet. Professor Lomberg, thanks so much for joining the Ben Shapiro Show. Hey, it's great to be here, Ben. So why don't we begin with uh, your take on some of the statistics surrounding coronavirus. One of the big problems I've been having is that we are operating in the absence of data. We're being told case fatality rates that obviously are not real. Uh, the suggestion that that 3 4% of people who are getting COVID-19 are dying from it is obviously untrue. We have no real great way of testing in randomized fashion for a- asymptomatic members of the population. We don't know how many people who get it die. We don't know what percentage of people do have it. And we don't even really know uh, by cohort, who is most at risk of this other than the elderly and the overweight and people with pre-existing conditions. And then on the basis of that, we're shutting down entire society. So you have an article about this in Forbes magazine. Number one, how should we think about COVID in relation to other diseases like the flu over the course of, say, a year? Well, uh, then there's two things we need to remember. One is that, yes, it is likely that corona is a lot less bad than what we were told. But it comes on top of uh, all the other things, you know, the seasonal flu and everything else we have. And it also seems to be coming very hard. So we're very clearly seeing that there is an issue. Basically, and you, know, you saw that very clearly, for instance, in New York, uh, you have a situation where you, at very short, in very short period of time, you get an enormous overload of the hospital system. And so there is an argument to try to contain this. But the thing that we're forgetting, and I think that was the other point that you were getting to, is that we're shutting down our economies, and that also has a huge cost. And so we need to get real about this challenge that we're facing. On the one hand, we do need to make some impact on slowing down corona. On the other hand, we, of course, also need to have an economy that will actually work afterwards. We have not had that conversation, and we do need to have it. Yeah, Professor Lomberg, it, frankly, it feels like we've been fibbed to a little bit about what this lockdown was supposed to accomplish. I think if people had said, OK, so the lockdown is here so that we don't overwhelm our medical system. And once we have enough ICU beds and ventilators available, then we're going to have to go back to some form of normal. It's not going to look exactly like normal, but it's going to be some form of normal. And that's that's acknowledging that a lot of people are going to get this when we reopen. That would have been a more honest conversation. The conversation, however, was not that it's, they made it seem as though. If we lock down, then we're going to all be able to avoid this virus. The studies that were put out there by University of Washington only went till August 1st. And so the suggestion was that the number of deaths being forecast was going to be the number of deaths in the end, as opposed to just over the period being forecast, which doesn't even take into account a second wave. And I think that's led to a lot of really dumb conversations and and also to a level of risk aversion that is not realistic, meaning that people think that they're going to be allowed to go back to work when the risk is zero. And that's just not the case. Exactly. And and Ben, I think we really need to have that conversation. Most people, and and I think most people in very good faith, just saw this as an oncoming tsunami. We got to do something. Uh, And and that's an understandable first approach. But now we know that you will have to do this something for a very long time. There's just a new science study out today that basically tells us that if you continue to try to lock down, you'll probably have to continue to do this until 2022. So for a year or two years. And of course, the current approach is not sustainable for one and a half years. There's no way you're going to get people's accept to do this in most rich countries around the world. And so what we need to have is a conversation about, is there a smarter way to do that? And yes, we're actually now seeing that. This very same science study is actually telling us the most effective approach is not the one that shuts down the hardest. Why? Because if you shut down really hard, almost nobody gets corona. That sounds like a really good idea. But of course, what then happens is once you open up in some way or another, you're essentially back to time zero. You will have the whole epidemic. You will have the whole thing crashing down on you and you'll have just as many deaths. Only now you've also destroyed your economy. So the reality is what we should be aiming at is something that locks us down somewhat, but not a lot. And that somewhat, I would surmise, is actually somewhat close to what, for instance, Sweden has been doing. So Sweden has said, look, we got to isolate the uh, the really vulnerable, so the above 70s. We've got to make sure that people distance themselves more. That's a smart and simple thing. 
But they've left most schools open. They've left most jobs open. They've certainly told people, if you can work from home, that's great. But they have left most businesses open. That means you have a situation where uh, you keep the, the infection below what the hospital capacity is, but you actually keep your society sufficiently open that this is a sustainable approach. And of course, it also means the second wave is not going to come crashing down on you. It's just going to be more of the same. Yes, it's not going to be pleasant, but it's going to be much cheaper and kill a lot fewer people. Professor Lomberg, I've been completely bewildered by the media coverage of Sweden because at the beginning, people were saying, okay, well, here, here's a great kind of counter case study to some of the measures that are being taken in, in Northern Europe. And now in the past week, past couple of weeks, they've been saying, well, look at Sweden experiencing this spike. And, and frankly, I've been kind of puzzled by the reaction to that. Of course, Sweden is experiencing a spike because Sweden didn't lock down in the other way the nations did. Why would we possibly be reacting to Sweden's policy over the course of a two-week period when their whole theory is that basically, if you allow more people to get it, then more people will have had it. And also we can handle it from a medical yeah. side. And so a year from now, let's come back and then we'll see how many people have had it and how many people have died and whether we've ruined our economy. Uh, oh, exactly. And of course, we can't wait for a year to actually see how that plays out. But the important point is to say Sweden is not actually having a situation where they're overloaded in the sense that their IC units are uh, overcrowded. They're not. They have built a lot of extra hospital capacity, and they are way be below that, actually. Uh, so what they are doing is exactly what most of the models would expect, that you lock down to the point where you flatten the curve so you can keep up, but not lock down so much that you actually have no curve left. Because then what happens is, as you open up, you're basically going to get the second wave just as bad. So this is a question about balancing. If I can just give you one example, you know, we do this all the time. Remember, there's about 40,000 people that die in traffic every year in the U.S. We still know how to avoid almost all of those 40,000 people dying. We just set the speed limit at three miles an hour, then nobody dies. But of course, we don't actually make that decision. We don't, on the other hand, say we should just have you know no speed limit. People can just go 160 miles or whatever. We say it should be 55 or it should be 85. And sensible people can discuss, should it be 55 or 85? But we would never have the conversation of saying, we'll just take it down to three or to 160. We need to find that smart middle ground where we both protect people, but also recognize we need to keep the economy going. We're speaking with Professor Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus and visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. So, so Professor Lomborg, some of the solutions that people have been proposing, I think, are utterly unworkable. People are talking about immunity cards, for example. First of all, that creates an incentive to forge immunity cards. But let's say that you even had immunity cards. I'm not sure exactly why they think that would work, considering we don't even know how long immunity lasts, if it even lasts at all. There's been talk also about mass testing. We're doing about 120,000 tests a day in the United States. Presumably, you'd have to do millions of tests a day if you were actually going to do mass testing in a way that basically prevented this from spreading in the population. That's why I've been saying for a while, I think in the end, this ends up being something quick and dirty. It's, it's basically if you're under the age of 65 and you don't have significant pre-existing conditions, you don't suffer from tremendous obesity, uh, then you're going to go back to work with social distancing, with a mask, with, with, a, with a six foot distance. We're going to make sure that restaurants distance their tables six feet apart. We're going to make sure that if there are movie theaters that reopen, that we have blocked out seats so that people are sitting far apart from one another, that we don't have big baseball games for the time until a vaccine is developed. That, that's more what society looks like two months from now than any of the other suggestions that are being made. I, I think you're absolutely right to say we need to have something that you can actually envision working. Uh, look, I, I, I love the fact that people are coming up with all these ideas and, and possibly uh, mass testing. Uh, so, you know, a number of really, really smart people have come out and said, if you could actually mass test in the uh, probably tens or even hundreds of millions at fairly low cost, that would probably be a very, very good way to keep the infections down. But as you're pointing out, we can't do that now. Maybe we can do that in half a year, and maybe that could take some of the uh, uh, pressure off of our social distancing. So there's a lot of smart policies out there, but the fundamental point is to remember, right now we have almost everywhere, except Sweden and a few other places, shut down way too hard. There's also some other places where they've shut down not at all, and that's also wrong. And we've shut down so hard that we're basically not seeing anyone getting corona. 
that in the long run is just simply unsustainable. So we need to find a middle ground. We need to find a way that can work, that is sustainable for most people. And we need all the smart ideas. Uh, I, I understand, you know, I think Scandinavia and, and the U.S. has very different senses of identity cards. We have no problem with our identity cards. Others might not. But, you know, look, different solutions to different places, but all of them to make sure that we save more people, but at the same time also safeguard the economy. Well, Professor Lomberg, really appreciate your time. President of the Copenhagen Consensus Visiting Fellow at Hoover Institution. Pick up his upcoming book, False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. Professor Lomberg, stay safe in there or out there, as the case may be. Absolutely will be. Thanks, Ben.